Upon this lonely field behind us, and nearly 180 years ago, in midsummer, and in front of hundreds of spectators, two men, a father and a son, were led out into the middle of the field blindfolded and made to kneel in front of more than a hundred armed men. In a flash and a roar, dozens of bullets cut through their body. They were buried in shallow graves hard by where they fell. Who were these two men? And why were they killed in such a brutal fashion? And who were the executioners that meted out such ruthless justice? In this series of videos, we'll be exploring the gangs that troubled and terrorized the early European settlers of Northern Illinois, and the communities that rose up against these gangs. Please join us in this journey. And if you're so inclined, please like and subscribe and leave us a comment. We'd love to hear from you. As this story has been recorded dozens of times in history books, periodicals, and newspapers, most of which were written down 50 years or more after the events took place, we intend to take a fresh look at the people and events related to this story. As such, we will generally rely on primary sources. In other words, those that were recorded within days to a few years of the events, including period newspapers from Rockford, Ottawa, and Sangamon, Illinois, U.S. Census records from Illinois and Ohio, U.S. Bureau of Land Management records, Ohio legal records, and Ogle County, Illinois probate records and legal records. We will sometimes also utilize secondary sources, histories which were typically recorded within a generation of the events, where many of the principal parties were still alive, but where memory of the events cannot be fully relied upon. These include works such as the 1854 book, The History of Illinois from the Commencement as a State in 1814 until 1847 by Thomas Ford. The 1859 book, Sketches of the History of Ogle County, Illinois by Henry R. Boss. And the 1868 book, History of DeKalb County, Illinois by Henry L. Bowies. Finally, we will occasionally use tertiary sources books and articles written 40 years or more after the events, when most living participants had long since passed away, and accurate memory of the events was rapidly fading. These will only be relied upon where the reported facts appear to be based upon primary sources. Long before cowboys and rustlers roamed the American West, before outlaws terrorized stagecoaches, and before gunfights were a feature of your favorite corral, Similar stories were playing out on the prairie east of the Mississippi River in what was then the American frontier. The story of the Northern Illinois bandits and vigilantes of the 1840s has a familiar ring and has typically been portrayed as an old Western tale of good and evil, of right and wrong. But the details of history rarely reveal such stark, one-dimensional caricatures and instead often expose the events and the characters in much more nuanced shades. This story begins on the never-ending undulating prairie of what was then the wild northern portion of Illinois. Illinois achieved U.S. statehood in 1818, but the north and northwest portion of the state, which had largely been the province of Native American tribes, such as the Sauk, the Fox, and the Potawatomi, until the mid-1830s, was soon to be opened up as a result of these tribes finally being pushed across the Mississippi River by the constant encroachment of settlers and pioneers, and with the defeat of Chief Black Hawk by the frontier and state militias in 1832. European settlers quickly recognized the agricultural richness of the land, with prairie stretching for as far as the eye could see, interrupted by occasional groves of wood and timber, and well watered by meandering rivers and streams. From 1820 to 1830, the population of Illinois almost tripled from 55,000 people to 157,000 people, and then almost tripled again by 1840, when the population reached more than 470,000. Most of this growth was in the southern and central portions of Illinois. But as the threat of Native American resistance faded in the north, much of northern Illinois became the new frontier, ripe for settlement. With the retreat of the Native Americans, 
Northern Illinois was initially carved into Cook County to the east, LaSalle County in the center, and Joe Davies County to the west. But as the area filled up with settlers by the mid-1830s, several new counties were carved from these precursor counties, with Ogle County being formed in 1837 named for the Revolutionary War veteran and early Illinois settler Joseph Ogle, and with the county seat, the newly platted city of Oregon, established just west of the Rock River. Winnebago County emerged to the north of Ogle, Boone to the northeast, DeKalb to the east, Lee County to the south, Whiteside to the southwest, Carroll to the west, and finally Stevenson County to the northwest. These northern Illinois counties amidst the golden central plain of North America appear to be headed towards bright futures, but this idyllic setting was to be instead marred by a growing perception of lawlessness throughout the land. Not surprisingly, the new territory had not only attracted farmers, merchants, and professionals, but also people who felt that they could take advantage of the general lack of law enforcement and administration of justice. At this time, most Illinois counties were policed by a handful of men, typically the county sheriff and a few deputies, who often had to patrol over 500 square miles of territory. Some of the larger cities and towns also had a few justices of the peace, which aided in the effort. But generally speaking, law enforcement was brought to bear only many hours or even days after a crime had been committed. And even when caught and convicted, Criminals rarely served any meaningful time, as there were few jails in Illinois to be found during that period. Most communities could not afford a jail, let alone the care and feeding of those incarcerated. Instead, criminals were often driven out of the area, sometimes to the Native American territories to the west or to neighboring counties and communities. For capital crimes, such as murder, rape, and yes, even horse theft, they could potentially be hung although this happened less often than people today might imagine. And being hung by the civil authorities for horse thievery was a fairly rare occurrence. The first penitentiary in Illinois was built in 1833 in Alton, near the confluence of the Mississippi and Illinois rivers, and housed 24 prison cells. If county authorities could manage to arrest, try, and convict a criminal, and successfully hold on to them until sentencing, Then the Alton Penitentiary was one of the places where they were sent. Onto our northern Illinois theater, enter stage right the Driscoll and the Brody families, who migrated from Ohio in the mid to late 1830s and were among the earliest settlers of Ogle County, where most of this drama was to unfold. The Brody family was led by John Brody of central Ohio, and the Driscolls were led by their patriarch, John or Johnson Driscoll. The Driscolls hailed from Wayne County, Ohio, a mostly rural community midway between Cleveland and Columbus, Ohio. John Driscoll was born in Pennsylvania shortly after the American Revolution, around 1780, and he would have been around 60 years of age in 1840 when this story takes place. Some later reports suggest that even at this age, he was still an imposing figure as he was around six feet tall and roughly 200 pounds, which was quite large for that time. In May of 1831, when he was about 50, John Driscoll was indicted in Wayne County on charges of petty larceny and is believed to have served a few years in the Ohio Penitentiary in Columbus as a result. He would not have been the first nor the last person to look for a fresh start out on the western plains of Illinois. John Brody and his family settled in the southeast corner of Ogle County, in Dement Township, to the east of Kilbuck Creek, amidst a grove of trees that would take his name and come to be known as Brody's Grove. Today, this is just west of the intersection of South Woodlawn Road and Heel Road, about six miles northeast of the city of Rochelle. Additional details on the Brody family are shadowy, as they left little imprint on the legal documents of the day. By the time that John Driscoll and his wife, Mercy Aiken, migrated to Illinois, they had several adult children, including eight sons and five daughters, and they fanned out to multiple land claims in DeKalb and Ogle counties. The farmstead of John Driscoll, the patriarch, was in northeast Ogle County, 
in the southwest corner of Monroe Township, 80 acres just to the east of Kilbuck Creek amidst a grove of trees, and more than nine miles north by northwest of the Brody Farm. Today, Driscoll's claim can be found west of Interstate 39 and Illinois Route 15, and midway between Royster Road to the north and Big Mound Road to the south. Son, David Driscoll, who was about 30 years old at the time, had a farm about four miles to the south, again just east of the Kilbuck, and about two miles southeast of the town of Lindenwood. Eldest son, William Driscoll, who was born in 1804, had a farm with his wife, Margaret, about a half mile east of Owens Creek in South Grove Township of DeKalb County, about seven miles due east of Brother David's farm, and more than nine miles southeast of Father John's farm. William's younger brother, Pearson, or Pierce, also lived with William on the farm. Pierce Driscoll was married to Mary Brody, and so there was some familial connection, at least, between the Driscolls and the Brodies. And as we'll learn, William Driscoll's farm was to be a pivotal scene in the drama that later unfolded. Today, William Driscoll's claim can be found to the west of Malta Road and a little more than a half mile north of Old State Road. Now, when we talk about land claims, we are referring to the manner in which settlers would lay claim to a portion of land owned by the U.S. government, which was usually acquired after the forced removal of Native American tribes. Settlers would often move into an area years prior to the U.S. government putting the land up for sale and lay claim to it, typically by marking it in some fashion, then by slowly improving it, by building a log cabin, and then by making the land more arable and tillable. When the land came up for sale, often years later, the claimant would travel to the nearest U.S. land office, often two or three counties in the distance, and formally acquire the land via a land patent. The lands around DeKalb and Ogle counties were not put up for sale until the late 1830s and early 1840s, at just about the time of this story. And most farmers paid $1.25 per acre, which is about $180 in 2020 money an incredible bargain. And so it's no small wonder that settlers poured into the new territories from the south, north, and east. But it was nonetheless a difficult life. When we talk about the farms of these early settlers, we are generally talking about crude homesteads with log cabins, possibly one or two small log outbuildings, and but a few livestock, consisting of horses, cows, pigs, and chickens. Water was taken from local creeks or an artesian spring, if the landowner was so fortunate. Or they would need to hand dig a well, which was no small feat. There were few roads, only muddy or dusty pathways, often following old Native American trails. Travel was accomplished via walking, horse-drawn wagons, or horseback. Farm implements were few, and the household might also include a muzzle-loaded musket or shotgun used for defending the claim and its livestock against predators or interlopers. The Driscolls and Brodies were, of course, joined by many other settlers in the 1830s, pouring in from the south, the east, and even places north, such as Canada. By the 1840 U.S. Census, Ogle County was the fourth most populous county of the 26 counties in the northern third of the state, boasting more than 8,400 people, with only Cook, Will, and LaSalle counties to the east touting more. Indeed, of the approximately 100 counties in all of Illinois, Ogle County had already moved into the top 20 for population with the 1840 census. 
And while some later tellings of this story suggest that lawlessness in the region had somehow stifled Ogle County's growth, the facts instead suggest that it was among the first northern counties to fill with settlers. And so its subsequent problems may have been more due to the many new arrivals, jostling for wealth, position, and survival, coming into conflict with one another. Far to the west of the Driscoll and Brody homesteads was platted the newly minted county seat, the city of Florence, now Oregon, centrally located in Oregon Township, hard by the Rock River, and a key passage west. This was to be the administrative and judicial center for the new county's 24 townships, which spanned more than 760 square miles. Into this young city streamed merchants, lawyers, physicians, ministers, builders, craftsmen, and laborers. Log structures sprinkled the area, while crude frame buildings lined the riverway, where the Rock River served as transport for goods and travelers, and was the lifeblood of area commerce. City lots were being sold on speculation. Fancier brick buildings and wood frame structures sprung up along the city's main road, Washington Street, which ran along the construction site of the county capitol building, which was scheduled to be open in early 1841. Oregon was the typical American frontier town, a bustling beehive of laissez-faire capitalism, opportunism, and Judeo-Christian justice. But there was a growing unease throughout the northern counties of Illinois due to the perceived lawlessness. Area farmers complained of stolen horses and the threat of claim jumpers. Merchants and banks bemoaned larceny and the spread of counterfeit or wildcat currency. Recall that at this time, the U.S. government printed no standard currency, and so banknotes instead came from various state-chartered banks, some of which had little or no assets to back their printed currency, rendering them worthless. Such notes were referred to as wildcat money, as the phenomenon was earlier noted in the wilds of Wisconsin Territory. And without standardization of currency, counterfeiting was much more easily accomplished and plagued the merchants and banks of frontier cities and settlements. To administer justice, the newly formed Ogle County moved quickly to build proper county buildings in the new county seat of Oregon. By November of 1838, they drew up plans for a 40-foot by 50-foot two-story brick courthouse and an 18-foot by 18-foot two-story stone jailhouse, featuring three-foot thick walls. By the middle of the following year, the county land had been surveyed and graded, building contracts were awarded, and the stone foundation for the courthouse had been laid. But in September of that year, the surveyor noted a significant error in the original survey, as they had apparently located the courthouse incorrectly. And so by January of 1840, the fledgling county had to pay to move the courthouse foundation to the correct location. After this embarrassing mistake, New superintendents were appointed to ensure the expeditious completion of the courthouse and jail. By August of 1840, the construction of the new stone jailhouse was completed at a cost of $1,822, or about $260,000 in today's money. Construction of the much larger and refined courthouse just to the east of the jailhouse still had a ways to go, however, and wouldn't be completed until March of 1841 just in time for the start of the tour of the Ninth Circuit Court of Illinois, presided over by the newly appointed Circuit Court Judge, Thomas Ford. At that time, a Circuit Court Judge was literally that, a judge in court that traveled in a circuit over a wide territory to hear cases and to administer state justice. Thomas Ford's Ninth Circuit Court included nine Illinois counties, Bureau, DeKalb, Kane, Kendall, Marshall, Ogle, Peoria, Putnam, and Stark counties, a territory which spanned almost 4,000 square miles. From March through October of 1841, Ford traveled 650 miles from one county seat to another, making the rounds of each county seat twice during that interval, and starting with the Oregon County seat in Ogle County, scheduled for Monday, March 22nd of that year. This newly appointed circuit court judge, Thomas Ford, was born in 1800 in Pennsylvania. 
as his father had died when he was very young. His mother, Elizabeth, moved the family to Monroe County, Illinois, in search of a homestead and cheap land. With limited formal schooling, young Ford was nonetheless to receive tutelage from a mentoring attorney, and so was able to be admitted to the Illinois Bar in 1820 by the age of 20. Frontier Bars had a lower bar in those days. His legal career commenced in Galena, in Joe Davies County in Northwest Illinois, but did not start to flourish until several years later when he was appointed a state's attorney for the untamed Western District of Illinois a large area encompassing much of Northern Illinois. After multiple other judgeship appointments in Northern Illinois, Ford was appointed an Associate Justice to the Illinois Supreme Court in February of 1841. And his initial duties were to serve as the Ninth Circuit Court Judge. And so he moved his family, including his wife Frances Hambaugh Ford, and their five children, to Oregon, Ogo County's county seat. Thomas was said to be a small man of slight build and with less than a commanding voice. But two decades of law in the untamed Illinois North had nonetheless shaped him into a force to be reckoned with while on the bench. At this time, in late 1840 and early 1841, rumors were rampant throughout Ogle County and its environs that there were local gangs which engaged in horse theft with wide-ranging networks spanning the territory so as to easily move stolen horses from one location to another, thereby escaping detection by the authorities. These gangs reportedly also engaged in counterfeiting and waylaid travelers and merchants along lonely prairie roads, committing assault, theft, and even murder. Some law enforcement officials were said to have been paid off by this gang so as to look the other way or to help them to escape detection. Perhaps due to John Driscoll's former troubles with the law in Ohio, the attribution for these crimes, among the community at least, fell upon the Driscolls and the Brodies, as well as a few other county families, such as the Aikens of Washington Grove in Pine Rock Township, several miles to the southeast of Oregon. The Aikens, too, had familial relations with the Driscolls, as Mercy Driscoll, the wife of John Driscoll, was part of the Aikens' extended family. In addition to these families, the names of at least a dozen more men were being circulated as purported members of the gang, including William K. Bridges, a landowner from Taylor Township, several miles below Oregon. But by the end of 1840, there was little or no evidence that tied the Driscoll and Brody families directly to any of these crimes. Nor were they ever formally charged with any crimes. And perhaps this was due to authorities being paid off or perhaps owing to the sophisticated methods of this gang. Or perhaps there was actually little or no tangible evidence to support the rumors. It's difficult to say at this point, as the trail of evidence has long since vanished. Then, too, the direct neighbors of these families, particularly the Driscolls, had favorable views of them, based on subsequent anecdotal reports. But in spite of this, the communities of Ogle County in particular, and Winnebago County to the north, were growing and festering in the perception that this larger group of men were part of a loosely federated crime syndicate, a network of thieves, a gang of prairie bandits, and that the Driscolls in particular were the ringleaders. And in the first half of 1841, it was all to come to a head. In the next episode of this series, we'll investigate what happened in the early months of 1841 including initial arrests of purported gang members, the burning of buildings, the rise of vigilante groups, and bold confrontations on the prairie.